quello che io cerco è di costruire una struttura di linee, di profondità, di corpi che abbia una, una tensione e quindi eh, credo che la, tutta la mia fotografia sia giocata tra la, la tensione compositiva che devono avere le linee delle cose fotografate, riprese e il colpo di luce, cioè la combinazione tra queste due cose deve avere una forza che teoricamente immagino dovrebbe essere la forza di una fucilata, cioè una cosa sicura, precisa e, e colpire. Io qualche volta ho pensato di essere, che i fotografi sono come i pugili, vanno, colpiscono più forte che possono e poi tornano indietro. E nel mio caso io amo i paesaggi, sia quelli naturali che, che quelli urbani, seguo due filoni uh, diversi ma che porto avanti parallelamente, uno appunto è quello legato al paesaggio naturale, ispirato alle memorie storiche, all'archeologia, al, alle avventure, alle, alle esplorazioni, alla letteratura di viaggio e un altro filone diciamo più se vogliamo contemporaneo, largamente ispirato al cinema che poi in realtà è la mia vera fonte di ispirazione e che è quello che riguarda la, la città, le visioni urbane, l'architettura e lo spazio della città inteso in maniera scenografica. Eh, le persone non ci sono per vari motivi, perché negli spazi sconfinati, desolati, lontani, non c'è gente e di notte perché le città miracolosamente spesso si svuotano, anche le più affollate e quindi la, lo spazio resta come un'enorme scenografia abbandonata, eh, usabile a piacimento, sul quale uno può proiettare la propria storia, il proprio immaginario, le proprie manie, i propri sogni e, e forse sì, c'è una dimensione nostalgica comune a tutti e due questi filoni che è la visione del luogo che uno può immaginare è il luogo che deve essere ancora scoperto o che è, pure, è appena stato abbandonato e a me piace fingermi anche un fotografo di questo tipo qua, cioè un fotografo che scopre per la prima volta una cosa eh, oppure come l'ultimo che è rimasto a documentare quello che rimane di, un, di uno spazio che è stato abitato, vissuto, perché non si è dimenticato in fondo. Io sicuramente faccio il fotografo perché non, non, non mi avrei voluto fare il cinema, ho eh, fatto il fotografo perché era più facile costruirsi delle immagini, eh, avere un, un riscontro del proprio immaginario in maniera più veloce e più immediata facendo il fotografo. Eh, probabilmente sono semplicemente dei flash presi qua e là, catturati qua e là, a forza di farne tanti dopo tanti anni probabilmente costituiscono una trama coerente e, io quello che penso di essere fondamentalmente è un suggeritore, cioè uno che ti cerca di restituirti un'evocazione un e di metterti sotto gli occhi come dire, proprio uno spazio scenografico sul quale chi guarda può, nel quale chi guarda può proiettare quello, quello che crede. Insomma. È come quando uno ti racconta una storia troppo bene e ha, ha già fatto tutto lui. Io, Cerco di, fare, di raccontarla un pezzettino in modo tale che chi guarda possa finire, se crede, col proprio immaginario il viaggio che io ho appena cominciato. Hello, I'm John Southern and welcome to the SciArc Channel. I'm here in conversation with Gregory Crudson, the Director of Graduate Studies in Photography at the Yale School of Art. His newest body of work, Cathedral of the Pines, recently premiered at the Gogosian Gallery in New York. Gregory, thank you for coming to SciArc. It's my pleasure. I was curious about how your work really embraced different levels of production. So in the, the beginning, it was you working alone, and more recently, you've taken on crews, 
and had to pull permits to close streets and all these things that I don't think people normally associate with photography, they associate it with cinematography. But what struck me about that was that it was very similar to what architects do. We ultimately have to go out in the world, explore a site, come up with a vision and bring that to fruition through collaboration. No matter what level of production, I feel like I do have a singular story to tell in visual form. I've always been interested in using light and color to tell that story. At its height, Beneath the Roses, there were a hundred people involved in that body of work from beginning to end. And I do think the struggle is, in the end, is to try to find this, almost despite the, the enormous production, to have, in the end, a singular voice. Most people would associate photography with a solitary act. In some interviews that I've heard with you, you've talked a little bit about how now you almost operate in front of the camera during production. Despite the large production, at the core, photography is a singular act. It is a lonely act. Just the very act of putting a camera in front of your eyes is an act of isolating yourself from the world. It's an act of separation. So I think that most all photographers are drawn to the medium by a certain kind of aloneness or um, certainly a kind of voyeuristic um, impulse of wanting to see something that's forbidden or secret in some sense. When we're shooting, I, I want to have a direct relationship to the thing in front of me. So the camera is a kind of hindrance in a way. I, have a kind of alienated relationship to the medium. In, in what way? Well, I'm certainly not like one of those kind of photographers who has, always has the camera, you know, is always ready to take the picture. You know, I started off by saying I consider myself a storyteller, and then I use pictures to tell that story. So when I'm location scouting, or when I'm uh, planning a picture in the early stages, I never have a camera with me. I'm just like looking and trying to imagine what the story might be. You've also talked about your, your pictures as, as being moments, mm. and I don't think for a lot of people that necessarily conjures narrative. And right. are all these moments, do they have a kind of continuity for you? I am very much aligned with this single moment. I don't have much interest in what happens before or what happens after. It's a very kind of condensed narrative. It's a story that asks more questions than it answers. I consider that limitation a, a strength because I f can fully invest in the single moment and make it as mysterious and as beautiful as I can. I think that moment, and I was reminded of it when I was uh, examining all the, the photographs from Cathedral of the Pines, mm. the, the idea of place is very important, mm. it seems, in your work. Well, yes. I mean, for me, location, 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 that's sort of central to my pictures and might be central to all photographers. In my particular case, I have a landscape or setting that captures my imagination. And almost all of my pictures exclusively have been photographed in a series of towns in the Berkshires. And I think we could trace that back to, that's where my parents had a country house. Mm -hmm. However, in a certain way, it could be anywhere. I'm just using that place as a kind of backdrop to create my own story, some kind of aspect of the American vernacular that I feel like I'm aligned to. Is it nostalgic in any way? I mean, I love that word because uh, for me, the way I read nostalgia is it's a longing for something that um, never was. It's nostalgic in a way that uh, almost a kind of perversion of that in a certain way of like trying to heal a wound or reconnect to a moment. In the interiors that you generated, it struck me when I started to look at details how there really is no contemporary mm. in the work at all. The phones are rotary dial or they're push right. button or can't be pegged at a time. I do not, as you say, like want any indicators of contemporary life. I want everything in the picture to feel ordinary and familiar but outside of time. But Is that a kind of liberating element for I, you, for, for imagining the scene, or? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's certainly not like a period piece, right. you know? So I'm not referring to like, let's say, Mad Men, a particular time period. The best way I can describe it, it feels like nondescript. So I want all the spaces, all the objects in the space, all my uh, subjects and the clothes they wear, 
and the cars and the houses, all to feel ordinary but aged down and slightly musty. So there's nothing, there's, it all feels kind of like it's been there, it's gonna sort of stay in that kind of circumstance. It probably references in a certain way my childhood, sure. but in a vague way. It's more like the kind of iconography of that time period. You know, I use these nondescript cars, for instance, that we have to find and sort of bring into the picture. So we, ha we have an intern whose sole job it is is to drive around the towns and look for these nondescript cars. So I'm curious, you know, it's never going to be a monster truck or, uh, <laughs> it, you know, there's never an extreme. There's kind yeah. of a consistent right. smoothness to it. So right. I'm, I'm wondering how you use that in the work to, to right. backdrop your subjects. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the monster truck is a really good metaphor generally. Like, I, there is, will never be the monster truck of anything in my pictures because right. it's really important that everything in my pictures feels ordinary and not spectacular. The landscapes, the houses, the cars, the subjects, all of it. Like there's, because I'm trying to create something beautiful from that. So I want a tension between the kind of seemingly ordinary drabness of an interior and the beauty of the picture. So there's that using light and color to transform and make it in its own way spectacular, like a kind of spectacular drabness. Your work's often been described as dark, uh, even grotesque in, in natural wonder right. photographs. The more recent in Cathedral of the Pines, the grotesque is there. And I'm, I'm wondering, as you've immersed yourself in these rural landscapes, which I think are part of Americana, I completely right. agree. I grew up in the South. As you've moved from Natural Wonder and into Cathedral of the Pines, how has the grotesque continued to manifest itself, or the darkness? Well, in Cathedral of the Pines, it was five years in the making, actually, and did represent, of, uh, at the early stages, a very dark period of my life. My ambition there was actually to make the most hopeful and positive pictures I've ever made. And, in a certain way they are that, but in another way they still maintain a certain kind of darkness. But that particular, that line, that tension that I'm really looking for is that perfect symmetry between like beauty and sadness, let's say. At the core of it, I think these pictures are about trying to find the light and trying to find a sense of possibility. I think that's the theme in these pictures. I guess in the way that you conceive of the images um, when you're thinking about them in your head, does it, the idea of, of the sort of dark or um, grotesque actually come into that uh, kind of discussion once yeah. it leaves your head? Is it you still know, this, part this of that? Is, this is something that you, you know, might be hard to make sense of, but like my main preoccupation in terms of making the pictures are formal issues. It's like trying to find the perfect frame and like the tension between the interior and exterior space and lighting issues and the darkness that you refer to, which is clearly there, is something I'm just less conscious of. I mean, I think that's where the true kind of meaning of my pictures reside, but it's something I don't really spend a lot of time thinking about really. I allow that part just to exist and kind of bubble up from beneath the surface of things. Maybe Twilight being a good yeah. body of work to compare to Cathedral of the Pines and looking at the sort of spectrum, it seems like the reliance or attention to surreal or extreme yes. has receded into the background. It's become more about, I don't want to say hidden danger, but hidden um, qualities of terror within yeah. nature. If you look through my pictures, from earlier to later, it's, there has been this slow attempt to kind of drain any kind of literal narrative out of the pictures and have them be more kind of elusive, more open-ended, more psychological. And in these pictures, the Cathedral of the Pine pictures, certainly they're the sort of most 
visible manifestation of that. And it's also in these pictures, I want them to feel more like paintings and less than, less like films. Although we've used all the same cinema, cinematic production, it's done very, just as much restraint and quietude as possible. What was interesting to, to sort of experience the work in its entirety before we had a chance to, to talk today was the, again, connections to architecture in some way and the way we as designers see space. And um, if I was to use an example, Beneath the Roses, the incorporation of the soundstage where yes. the architecture becomes yes. the framing device for the shot yes. versus the sort of shots of hover from hover, which right. are ultimately field conditions. Right. In Cathedral of the Pines, it, it's, it's, architecture is still there, it's still mm. present. But it seems now to be less, I guess less as a framing device. The architecture no longer seems, or you don't seem to be as reliant on the architecture right. to do the, the kind of work of composition. Well, one very big distinction between Beneath the Roses and Cathedral of the Pines is all the interiors were done on sound stages in that work. And uh, I worked with art directors and with a big crew to build these things. In these new pictures, it's all on location. So we're dealing with real, physical spaces and sometimes very small spaces. And so they're just by the very nature of the spaces much more constrained and less operatic, less sort of large scale constructions. And, but to me, it was a great pleasure to work on location because, well, firstly, because of that great dynamic between the interior and exterior space. Just the unexpected surprises of being in real places. But if you trace all of my work in terms of architecture, I think qualities of the home appear in everything, every single picture, pretty much. You know, the domestic architecture has a kind of psychological meaning of uh, whether it's claustrophobia or voyeurism or qualities of discomfort. The window or the doorway or all these kind of framing devices occurs and reoccurs throughout the pictures. There is an attempt to try to understand where you are in relationship to home. Gregory, thank you for talking to us it's today and for coming to SciArc. It's great, I really enjoyed it. Per interpretarlo, tu devi praticamente diventare il paesaggio, no? E il paesaggio diventa te, di conseguenza in questa simbiosi non illustri ma inventi, crei. L'artista rifiuta quello che è la realtà, la deve violentare e, e, e farla sua. Quindi la realtà è sua, è lui che fa la realtà. La realtà di per se stesso non esiste se lui non la dimostra. In fondo dove c'è questo orizzonte c'è una fase così argentata. Andavamo una settimana a Praga, 67, ed è uscita questa foto, che è una foto abbastanza importante nella storia del mio percorso, anche perché poi fece nell'81 la copertina dell'annuario di Time Life. E feci questa e questa. Tra le due, forse io personalmente preferisco questa, però l'altra ha avuto più successo. 
Andavamo in gita i 4-5 amici, partivamo alle 7 del mattino, ci alzavamo e prendevamo l'alba, il tramonto e tutte queste cose. No? E allora queste cose le vedevano, ma le vedevano, erano io che gliele avevo fatte vedere. Cioè la cultura, tra virgolette, è anche quello che quando uno mi dice, o anche un amico che non fa fotografia, siamo andati in Francia, siamo passati in Provenza, c'erano i tuoi paesaggi se ci fossi stato tu. Loro non li avevano mai capito, c'erano i tuoi. Cioè questa, sono io che gli ho fatto vedere i paesaggi, attraverso di me hanno visto questi paesaggi, cioè io sono il testimone di far vedere il paesaggio in questo modo. La parte che ha significato al 90% il mio paesaggio è stata la Puglia e la Basilicata. Grande campiture, senza case, senza niente, tutte coltivate, anche se non c'è un contadino, ma è tutto... È tutto Diciamo, tutto non è abbandonato, no? è tutto pieno di, di, di semina. E allora ci sono i gialli, i verdi, i quadri, c'è tutto quel colore che interpretato a mio modo significava quello che volevo dire, la mia testimonianza. Allora questa parte qui che è più scura, non è più scura perché l'ho fatto più scura al computer, la parte che non c'era neanche in quei tempi, è perché quando passano nuvole, così per dare una spiegazione così fortunata, il sole veniva coperto in questa parte e questa parte veniva più scura. Dopo quattro secondi era più scuro il giallo e così io ho delle sequenze di, di, di questo mutamento, no? perché poi la fotografia è tutto un mutamento, come è la vita. Polaroid si presta molto alla manipolazione, è sempre creatività e creatività vuole dire anche cioè, liberarsi tra virgolette, del visto, del conosciuto per interpretare il non visto, per significare il non visto. Well, I, I suppose I had seen his work in my art history classes in art school, but I became much more uh, acquainted with it, better acquainted with it, once I had moved to New York after art school and I would visit the Whitney Museum. And I particularly was uh, struck by or felt an affinity for his interiors, which were mostly of these humble New York City apartments. Uh, maybe partly because I myself was living in a humble New York City apartment at the time, um, but also I, the, the psychological content really resonated with me. In my work I collaborate with a small team of actors and stylists to create fictional narratives in the form of painterly large-scale photographs. I mean, I started making dioramas before I was photographing them. My very first job in New York City was working in an architectural supply store and I was um, really inspired by the model building materials and that's when I started making dioramas and I suppose I, I did that for most of the 1980s 
Um, and then I got more into photography and, and then I ended up bringing the dioramas back into the photography. Um, so I use a lot of the same materials like balsa wood, things that I can cut without having to, you know, use a power saw, anything. I, I just don't trust myself around a power saw. Um, and I love work, working with my hands. So for me, it's a really nice adjunct to working behind the camera. So I get to work with my hands and I get to, you know, photograph it. And I actually, photographing the dioramas is one of my favorite parts of the project because that's when the final image really starts to come together. When I start lighting the diorama and choosing which lens I'm going to photograph it with. Um, for me that's when the, the image really starts to come to life and that's in, a, in some ways the most exhilarating part. The response was quite immediate. <laughs> um, I got uh, attention really from all over the world. Um, I, I was approached by people from Russia, you know, magazines from China, um, galleries from France. It was really quite, um, quite awesome. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. Um, just the sheer reach that um, lens culture has was, was really uh, quite striking. <laughs>